Thank you, Caroline and Helen. And indeed, yeah, it's worked out beautifully um, that our themes are linking so well across this particular strand. Um, so I'm here on behalf of a number of colleagues, and um, many of you in the room will know them. Um, Jen Harvey is the head of our Learning, Teaching and Technology Centre in TU Dublin, and Kevin O'Rourke is our Digital Campus Architect, which is an interesting role that comes obviously into this topic as well. And Kevin will be here tomorrow. He's not able to be here today, if you did want to talk more with him about that. But we're also collaborating with Purdue University in Indiana um, on this project. And uh, our colleague there leading on, on the project with us is um, Jason Fitzsimmons. Um, so we were inspired to look at openness around physical learning spaces in a campus-based institution, really following, here, uh, following the keynotes and the discussion of openness at EdTech, um, the Irish Learning Technology Association conference back in 2018. And when we knew that OER19 was coming to Galway, it seemed like the ideal chance to begin to engage with this and think about it. Um, but we are novices. Uh, we're hopefully legitimate peripheral participants in this community um, starting to think about openness. Um, and it's very, very timely because not only are we constructing a new technological university, it's the first one in Ireland, we're also constructing new physical uh, campus buildings in the city campus. And they're also engaged in that in Purdue. So we're going to think, uh, we're thinking a little bit in this paper about open education in the context of learning space design and what a learning space is in terms of his physical space in 2019. Um, how have learning spaces in campus-based institutions been opened up? And technology has clearly um, changed how we use our physical spaces. Um, so therefore, what has the design and uh, use of physical learning spaces, how is that changing, how is it being remediated through the evolving use of blended and online learning? And if we have more open spaces, um, does that mean we're going to have more open practices? And that's what we've been thinking about over the, over the last while. A little bit of context here, as I mentioned, um, both our institutions are involved in the redesign of physical spaces. So in Purdue, a new active learning center has been built, um, and Jason has kindly supplied these images. We haven't been able to go there just yet, um, in 2017. And placing that at the middle of the campus as an active learning center was a deliberate decision, and uh, hopefully, again, is, is opening up and changing the kinds of practices people are engaging with there. The building has 27 active learning classrooms, and the STEM focus um, in that institution obviously is very strong, and they're consolidating libraries into one location as part of this progress. So we're looking at active learning becoming very central to the mission of the university expressed through those spaces. In Dublin, um, Technological University Dublin City Campus, um, we're constructing a new campus at Grange Gorman in the west of the city. We're on multiple sites at the moment, and the longer term plan, as colleagues in Ireland will know, is to draw us all together on the one site um, in Grange Gorman. And that's a big cultural change as well as a big physical change because our individual sites have their own working practices and cultures established over many years, and suddenly we're going to be on one site um, for the first time. Um, so we're looking specifically there at how architecture um, is shaping that campus, that change, how um, change management is happening, uh, and in turn how we are changing pedagogies and use of technologies uh, are influencing and interacting with that. This is very much a work in progress. It's exploratory, and I really do welcome responses, questions, suggestions, critique um, at the end of the presentation. So what we're finding in our work so far, and looking at the literature around this, um, in terms of architecture and education, there's very well developed research on the design of schools and classrooms for obvious reasons. That's the compulsory education uh, sector. And clearly, there's a lot of public investment in those kinds of buildings. Um, this seems to be less well developed for higher education. So we don't see the same amount of literature and the same amount of investigation around this. Um, there are differences too, important differences. We're more digital, we might say, um, in schools, digital um, in interactions with the web and so on are more tightly controlled for obvious reasons uh, and firewalled and so on. Um, whereas we're all interacting in the digital space right now, I imagine, albeit we're in a lecture theater of this kind. And we're in the post compulsory sector. We've got people opting in and out. We've got flexible learning. We've got lots of different patterns of interaction with the institution and the physical spaces. So the question we've been asking is how well current learning theory and innovations in teaching and learning are being reflected in the design of our physical spaces. 
And the drawings here um, perhaps reflect some of the challenges that we might have. When, when new spaces are commissioned, these are the kinds of drawings that can come back, um, showing very fixed linear spaces. And so the challenge for us is how to have discussions uh, through, across the institution and with the people designing those spaces um, to make them more flexible and to open them up to different kinds of activities on site. I think everyone will probably have seen this picture before. Um, it's a 14th century uh, image of a lecture. And we use this very often in the postgraduate diploma and third level learning and teaching in TU Dublin as a provocation to get people talking early on in their workshops. They may have only been with us for a couple of weeks in their early career lecturers who are engaging with learning and teaching and active learning methods for the first time. And we ask them just to look at this image and to respond to it. And I'm sure you've been asked to do that yourselves at conferences and in other settings up to now. And so we see the construction of the space here as very fixed. Um, and it's also reflective of power. We have the uh, speaker elevated and we can see the steps up to the lectern, um, to the podium there. Um, we can talk about the makeup of the class, uh, the gender, um, the age range, the ethnic background of these people. Um, but we do see that there is some collaboration and some discussion going on, even if it's not supposed to be. There are two people talking up in the back corner and there's somebody having a nap there as well. So it's not that lectures have um, necessarily changed all that much in some respects from this time. Um, but the physical space perhaps uh, hasn't changed as rapidly as we might expect with changes in our student body and in the kinds of work that we're doing. And we're also looking here at an age of um, information poverty, if you like. The information is held by the lecturer, by the reader, um, and it's not abundant. It's not available to the other people in the room, and they need to hear it from that person. In spite of the length of time that's gone by since that image would have been created, um, as I say, we don't necessarily see huge change in the design of some of our spaces. Um, now, hopefully today, um, you're not feeling obliged to, to listen to the speakers, but you're free to interact online and with each other in the room, even if we're in um, a lecture theatre <coughs> space. Um, but often students don't feel that they can do that. And uh, Kevin picked out this article a while back from the Irish Times talking about Irish students uh, reporting having less contact with their lectures uh, than they would like. And um, one of them here talking about the lecturer standing and reading off the slides, I can do that at home, and this um, is affecting their attendance. Um, so this is calling into question what we're doing in these spaces, what's going to make it worthwhile for students to join us on campus, what should the campus look like, and what should we be doing? So our approach uh, to this project is collaborative, uh, research undertaken in partnership, and currently we're at this preliminary stage of literature review and also some desk study. Purdue are ahead of us because of the active learning um, space that they've recently had built uh, over there, and they have um, already been out to the field and done um, some data gathering around that space. So we're looking at that and analysing that with them, looking at the methods that they've used and how we might uh, deploy them in Dublin and identifying existing institutional practices and how we might influence and change those. We also have a symposium coming up, which I really wanted to highlight in the talk today. It's been funded by the National Forum here in Ireland, and it'll take place in May 2019. Like any of the forum seminars, they're open to all participants, so you're very welcome to join us. And um, Maybe we'll have some online uh, dimension to that for colleagues not based here. Um, this is going to inform our research further, and we are hoping to attract academic students, architects, and other interested parties to that symposium shortly. And then primary research um, beginning in Dublin in September, um, drawing on the approaches and methods uh, from Purdue, case studying. Um, we will uh, draw on activity theory uh, as well to look at how we model the practices around the campus. And again, just to pick up on Helen's work um, from uh, citing Barad, the, the, the fact that there are no boundaries around our learners um, any longer, that we draw on some of that work as well. Um, so that's where we're at in terms of planning and taking forward this work, and the outputs are intended to support the planned use of spaces in both institutions. Um, I think Helen has articulated, and Caroline uh, beautifully already, uh, open and what we're talking about with openness. I just wanted to include this in terms of how we're defining open. Again, it's difficult for us to define. Um, but thinking about the kinds of pedagogies we would like to see, um, how are we going to open up teaching? How can our spaces contribute to that and give more agency to learners as contributors to knowledge? Um, and that's, again, what we're thinking about in terms of the design of spaces here. We know that spaces have been blurring for some time. Um, VLEs are part of the mainstream since the early 2000s. 
We've had the previous projects around open educational resources. Um, here in Ireland, we had NDLR, which was um, re referenced earlier today, Joram, Merlo in the States and in North America. We have open scholarship and access in libraries, and we know that students are constantly connected ownership of smartphones in amongst the Irish, uh, the population of students in Ireland is estimated at over 90%. So learning has been taking place inside and outside of the classroom and the campus for a long time. And how do we uh, exploit that further? We could argue that any space is a learning space in 2019. Um, we can access our learning uh, through our devices, no matter where we might happen to be, whether that's formal or informal. We have some nice examples here from Purdue, and again, that would reflect the move from formal to less formal spaces and spaces that are flexible and allow for different kinds of pedagogical approaches to be taken. So moving from our perhaps our more traditional lecture settings into um, open spaces under stairwells and so on that were perhaps not used in days gone by, but that can be made over slightly changed, given appropriate furniture in, in order to allow students to work um, in their groups outside of class. This is a Padlet wall from a little exercise we ran briefly again in our diploma uh, class just as they were starting their studies this semester. And we asked them just to go out for 15 minutes and walk around the building in Angel Street in Dublin and take pictures of what could be learning spaces. And interestingly, most of the pictures that came back weren't lecture theatres or formal tutorial rooms. Um, so it's a little bit difficult to see on the slide here, but you can see that we have corridor spaces, we have landing areas on the middle of floors of the building, um, we had canteen spaces, coffee dock areas turning up. And we've run this before with our master's groups and asked them to take pictures of places where they learn when they're not on site. And we've had garden sheds, kitchen tables, spare rooms, uh, all kinds of spaces coming back. I think evidencing that where we do our learning has, has clearly changed and how we respond to that is important in the design of our new spaces. In terms of the literature, um, what we've seen so far is an emphasis on trying to uh, explore cause and effect to some extent. Um, so we see people reporting changes in um, the design of space contributing to some learning benefit or a benefit for teaching in terms of growing confidence uh, amongst academics or more success with trying active learning strategies. But perhaps what we haven't seen so far in the literature is a closer look at the um, interaction between space technology and the pedagogical practices. And again, if I can reference my colleagues talking about entanglement, talking about the lack of boundaries, that's the space where I think it would be useful for us to do some further research. Um, that we see um, both students and staff, I would argue, as co-creators of that environment and that digital environment. Um, so there is evidence out there in terms of the effect of space on what we're doing. Um, and as I say, some of the work around confidence and enhanced practice amongst lecturers using active learning spaces. Um, and we would like to build on that and look at what those um, interactions might be. Um, what's the connection between the students and the technology and the learning as they're doing it? And how are educators um, evolving their practice around that? Can then we change practice by changing spaces? And that's the next question I suppose we're interested in here and trying to theorize around that. Um, Rook Choi and MacDonald have looked um, at learning theory and architecture and called for a much stronger connection to be made there. And again, I think that's something that we would like to look at in the course of this project as well. Um, perhaps drawing on activity theory, uh, theoretic approaches as well, where we look at how tools and instruments mediate activities and mediate uh, practices. I'm very fortunate to work with Kieran O'Leary at TU Dublin, whose doctoral research is looking at socio-materiality and the entanglement of people and their technologies and their practices. And again, we would see links there to research the interaction between space and activities and practice. So we'd like to use that research and theorise further to inform the consultations that are going on in our institutions at present between the people teaching and learning and those designing the spaces and the building uh, and building the spaces indeed for teaching and learning. And there's a key role for academic developers and educational technologists here. And this morning, um, listening to Sheila McNeil, Bill Johnson and Keith Smith, um, they talked about academic development and open education being at the heart of organisational development, um, which is a great message that I'll be bringing home from here um, in terms of the development of the technological university as an entity and also the physical development of the university in the new campus. 
So are we going to see more open practices with changes in open spaces? And that's um, what we're going to look at henceforward in this work. Um, we have previously given as many opportunities as we can for students particularly to contribute to the design of what we're doing in the institution back in our, our DIT days as well. And we have a new project called Co-Create, which is to design the curriculum framework for the, the technological university, um, which will involve students um, in participating there around de uh, designing uh, their learning. We're looking at more uh, opportunities for experiential learning and undergraduate research as part of that framework. And the sharing of teaching practices across teams and collaborative working and programs is something that we've seen thriving recently in our institutions. And I think many of us can say that following the Delta initiative, particularly that the National Forum has launched, which uh, has seen awards for program teams um, engaging actively in, in redesigning and reviewing their programs. So we're arguing that there does need to be more flexibility in the configuration and reconfiguration of spaces to facilitate and promote these kinds of practices. Um, but we do need to find out which approaches are most effective and to theorize further around that. So the project that um, we're linked to in the TU Dublin around this is titled Enabling Pedagogical Opportunities in the Design of Learning Spaces, or EPOL, which isn't exactly uh, tripping off the tongue, but we'll try and come up with a better acronym for it. And it's a change management project involving staff and students building on our existing practices and um, also looking at the effects of particular room configurations on the kinds of activities that are taking place. So what we're doing is configuring spaces in our existing campus as they might be configured in the new campus in Grange Gorman and researching with staff and students as to the effects of that over the next number of months. Um, the worry has been that we get to Grange Gorman and if we haven't tried anything before we get there, we'll just carry on doing what we always did. So trying to use the old campus in new ways before we move. So you can see the old furniture and the old rooms on the images here, but these are um, some examples of room configurations that we've been looking at. And we're encouraging staff to use these spaces um, to think about their choices. What can they do in these spaces and what their options might be or what their options aren't uh, going to be in certain cases? How will that impact upon the students' learning and on their own teaching practice? So our next steps, the symposium, as mentioned, um, please do look out for further details of that and you're welcome to join us. We're working on a collaboratively authored paper arising from the first phase of the study and our field work then will commence later on uh, in the year. I'd just like to say thank you all very much and I do welcome questions, critiques, suggestions, etc. Thank you very much. Yeah, we have questions there. Do you need the mic? I think, yeah, you need it. Thank you, Claire. That was really interesting. Um, one conversation I have with one of my colleagues back in Edinburgh um, is about when we talk about hybrid learning spaces and we talk about people learning online and learning on campus, we, we end up talking about the choices people have when things go wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and I wondered whether inside your project, you were looking at not just the configuration of space and what might happen in them, but how these different spaces might then be supported as well. Mm -hmm. Because our, our, the conversation we have plays out into, um, there's always a wider set of choices if you're an on-campus student when something goes yeah. wrong than there might be if you're an online student. And it strikes me that in some of these spaces, there is the potential for a wider set of help than there perhaps might be in other spaces as well. So I wonder, and that will have attendant implications on how willing people are to do things in them. So I wondered if that was within the scope of what you're looking at. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're very lucky in the EPOL project um, that we have the um, a range of stakeholder, a range of divisions of the institution are involved in that. And AV particularly have been very, very closely involved and ICT services. So we have um, tried to design that in from the outset. But I absolutely agree. Um, we had issues with our Wi-Fi a couple of years back on the city campus, and um, there was definitely, um, you know, a period of time where people weren't trying even simple quiz tools and so on in lectures, and they just, they just, you know, were resistant to that. Um, so it does need to be, you know, I think the things people are saying about the Grange Gorman campus is it needs water and Wi-Fi, and we, we'll have all heard that talked about before. Um, it's got to work, and for everything else to match in with that. So, um, I mean, one of the interesting things that's happened is um, because you're, you're building on that scale, 
tendering procurement processes and so on have been going on for years and by the time the designs have come back AV have reported that you know equipment has moved on and they've had to um, change lists change orders and so on um, and change suppliers to sort of get the more up-to-date equipment in so there, there are all kinds of lags in the process that affect it too um, Thanks, Claire. Um, just, just to say, we're doing some really similar research at City University London Great. as well um, mm -hmm. that you might be interested in yeah. with some redesigned learning spaces and then going in doing teaching observations to see how staff are using those um, and, and, and kind of, you know, building up the sort of evidence of whether it is actually changing mm -hmm. um, pedagogical practices as well or whether they're just kind of going in and yeah. doing the teaching they were doing before in mm -hmm. these new flexible spaces. Mm -hmm. So I'll be able to put you in touch with the team if you're interested. That in, would be brilliant. Thank yeah. you, Jane. That would be really yeah. helpful. That's, that's exactly what we're, we're trying to look at. <laughs> yeah. Is, uh, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Can we call this um, an afternoon?